I wanted to start by showing you some pictures. Now these pictures are actually from the um, Darmstadt archive, so the International uh, Musik Institute in Darmstadt, um, when they were celebrating their uh, 70th anniversary of the Darmstadt courses, uh, they gave David access to the entire photo archive, and, uh, and David was going through the photo archive, and one of the things he said to me was, there's so many pictures of men looking at scores, that if you look at the visual language of how Darmstadt is represented, most of it is photographs of men looking at scores. Uh, not looking at performers, uh, but looking at scores. So you see, oh, there we go. So you see this sort of classic, they're smoking, so it looks sort of old, um, and they're all studying the scores together. I'll just move this. Um, they're studying the scores outside. It's nice alfresco scores. They're like sort of fighting to get closer to Brian Fernie Ho so they can look more closely at the scores. So there's lots of scenes like this where it's like people are desperately trying to look at the scores, like they're trying to get past other people. Um, Again, Helmut Lachenmann, more looking at scores. This is my favorite guy. He looks like Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, like went to Darmstadt by accident, um, <laughs> sort of, uh, but he didn't choose to fight to look at a score. Um, so you see photograph after photograph like this. What I did find interesting was that occasionally you actually see female students in some of these in some of these photographs, but they're never usually right at the front a lot of the time. They they didn't fight hard enough to look at the scores. But I thought that these photographs were really really interesting because. That's how often music is presented to us. It's presented to us as a score that should be looked at. <laughs> so these aren't images where you can see people looking at performers <laughs> or composers talking to performers or, compo or maybe even performers pointing things out to the composers. Do you know the dominant way that it's presented is that it's people looking at the score and the score is the most important part of the piece. And for me, if just pardon for one second. Um, bit a bit uh, awkward trying to toggle between these two things so for me um, I think I thought these pictures were very very interesting because it told me it, it basically tells the story of contemporary music which is that the score is the most important thing and I think it's really sort of tragic because a lot of composers who maybe can't get good rehearsal time or can't work with really really great performers for them the score is all they have <laughs> That's the most important representation of their work. And I'm sure you've all had experiences uh, where somebody says to you, you know, I'm gonna play you a recording of a piece, but, but like it's very bad recording, so look at the score. Because the real information and the truth of the piece is somehow located in the score, it's not located in the recording. When uh, people teach music, they tend not to teach from recordings, they teach from scores, because they're more useful pedagogically because they can sort of begin to analyze things and say, okay, we can see how this modulates here, or something like that. So nobody teaches Beethoven hourly. <laughs> like nobody says, let's put on like a symphony and get people to try and understand what's happening. They say, let's look at the score and analyze all the harmonies. I also think that's pretty interesting because there's a lot of music cognition research which shows that even professional musicians, if they're only listening to a recording, often have no idea where the modulation is going. So they're listening to it and they know it's going somewhere different, but they can't tell you, oh, that's the subdominant minor, that's an interesting choice, because they don't listen like that. So there's this weird disconnect between how we often teach music and represent it visually and how it actually sounds when we're in a concert hall and how we listen to it and sort of perceive it. And these sort of pictures encapsulate that for me. Um, with new music, and I teach, I'm sorry, I, I don't teach at Brunel anymore. <laughs> I, teach, <laughs> I teach at the University of the Arts in Stuttgart. And with the students I teach there, or the students I teach, David Helbig and I both run workshops at Darmstadt, um, we're often trying to get them away from the score because they invest so much time in doing this very, very complex notation. And there's a reason for that. Oh, sorry, I missed out one more. There's Stockhausen with people. I thought that was Phil Niblock, but it's not. <laughs> but I think it looks like, is that not him? Okay, sorry, I can't see properly from this angle. Uh, so 
this is often what's presented to young composers who are interested in working in new music. This is a Stockhausen piece. They're presented with scores that look like this. They're very, very complicated. There's Fernie Ho. Um, there's John Cage. And the composers become sort of enamored of this type of notation. And there's lots of good reasons that they are, because a score like this, in particular, allows a lot of imaginative scope. If you're a performer, you can bring an awful lot to this score. You can make a lot of decisions by yourself. With this score, of course, you can bring your own individual interpretation, but there's a lot more very, very clear, precise direction about exactly what you're supposed to do. And so one of the things that we often have to deal with when we're teaching young composers is try to sort of get them away from the romance of this. Do you know, because this looks really complicated. It looks really, really amazing. It looks really, really austere and intellectual. Uh, but often they will write this and they can't get any performer that will actually make it sound the way it sounded in their head. <laughs> so they have this weird sort of situation where it's like writing a film script and never shooting the film. And the process of writing film scripts is that you write many, many, many versions, many drafts of the script. And then at the last, the last stage, you make what's called a shooting script, where you write in all of the directions and where the cameras will be in the different angles. Then you shoot the movie, and then you edit it, and then you re-edit it, and then you probably edit it again. So filmmakers will look at the shooting script as a very interesting document which tells them about how the director perceived the film to be. But they know that there'll be a difference between the shooting script and the actual finished version of the film. In music, we're stuck with the shooting script. <laughs> you know, we think that this is the best version. And even with people like Fernie Ho or Stockhausen, there's undoubtedly performers' versions of these scores where things were changed or they sort of fake this bit or they give this bit more time where the scores are actually changed a bit by the composers, uh, sorry, by the performers. Um, I, did a, I did a piece that I toured a lot with the Arditi Quartet and I got to see a lot of their scores and their scores are covered in changes <laughs> and things that are modified from the originals and the handwriting and things that are rubbed out and they're mostly playing music that looks like these two composers, like Stockhausen and Fernieho, and still a lot of it is altered. But that doesn't make it through to the, 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 the sort of the scores that you buy when you're studying these pieces. So when I'm thinking of contemporary music and when I'm thinking of what notation can mean, sort of what I'm interested in is, is sort of how people fetishize aspects of this notation. And one way that they do that is with tattoos. So this is a tattoo of 4 minutes and 33 seconds by John Cage that I found. There's quite a lot of these. Quite a lot of people have got this tattooed on their arm. Um, this is Brian Eno's uh, music for airports that somebody got tattooed. And this is the best because this is Christian Wolff's Edges, December 1952 by Earl Brown, and 4 minutes and 33 seconds. Like all three for the price of one on one back by a double on a double basis back. So these the idea that this notation is so fetishized that people are getting tattoos of it of like copying John Cage's handwriting onto their body and I know that there is somebody made a font that is John Cage's handwriting that's a font that you can buy so that you can write, you know, letters to your mom in John Cage's handwriting. Do, do you know what I mean precisely? So that sort of shows me that we're very interested, we're very sort of enchanted with this visual world. We think it's really, really cool. And, and so that uh, sort of, that is something that's never gonna go away. We're always going to continue to be nerded out by this. There will always be composers going, you need to buy Blackwing pencils or only the notebooks from Muji are the ones that you should get. Or there's this great stationery shop and they sell red pencils. Like there's always gonna be that. It's part of the sort of the genetic makeup of composers. So given that, where I find myself as a performer is Th either facing performances that I see of this sort of stuff, like the stuff that's more, much more graphic, not the Brian Fernie Ho or the Stockhausen, but the Cage, the Wolf, the Earl Brown, where I see some of these performances and they just seem, th they seem at times, there's some that are amazing and there's composers that are really dedicated, um, but I see a lot of performances of these that, to be honest, just seem half-assed because you can get away with that. <laughs> You can get away with not really preparing a performance of December 1952. 
You can sort of fake it and people think it sounds great. And if you're a good improviser, it'll just sound great. But it would sound great whether you're playing this, this or this. Do you know which w whichever score you decided to do? Um, and through sort of being in a lot of experiences where at times I've heard exceptional performances of graphic scores and at times I've really heard what felt like free improvisation that was then called a, a graphic score. I was sort of, I got to the point where I thought I don't want to write any more graphic scores that people perform. I only want to write graphic scores or text scores that people um, imagine in their heads. And that was sort of where I was going for a while. Um, and, and the reason why is because I sort of feel that we should bring the same resources to bear on this sort of notation that we would on that. We should have to study as hard, we should have to sort of really, really dig into it as deeply. And the analogy that I use for this is linear B. So linear B is um, a form of Mycenaean Greek. I think it was, I think it was discovered at like 1850 BC. Of course, it was discovered by somebody British who, you know, acquired the tablets um, and then decided to figure out Greek um, for the Greek people. Um, so what's interesting about linear B, it's an ideogrammatic language, you know, there's sort of symbols. It doesn't really bear any relationship to, to you know, contemporary Greek. And uh, when it was discovered, nobody could figure out any of it. Nobody knew what it meant. So in the 1890s, or I think 1886 was when the first tablets were unearthed, um, you know, people are thinking, what is this? We have no clue what this is. And it took from, the 18, from 1886 until the 1950s for people to figure out the language. And it took several generations of linguists who basically did the work of uh, cryptographers <laughs> uh, to be able to decode linear B. So linear B is often used in like cryptography school. If you're gonna be a spy, you have to learn how they decoded uh, linear B because it was so difficult to figure out what something meant. And it turned out to be shopping lists, which is amazing. Um, I also think about the movie Arrival. I don't know if any of you have seen this movie. So this is a 2016 science fiction film. And in the film, spoiler alert, uh, you can block your ears if you're planning on seeing Arrival. Uh, spoiler alert, these aliens come to Earth and they are, they're sort of living in this structure above Earth and they're sort of these shadowy presences in this sort of aquarium-like structure. And they draw, in the air, they draw in this structure with ink, sort of like a squid drawing with ink. And so the hero of the film is a linguist, which is, you know, fantastic. And she goes along, she's played by Amy Adams, and her whole function is to go along and figure out what do these things mean? Are they random or are, is it language? And so over the course of the movie, she figures out how these are language and how it functions as language. And it's, it's given, it's sort of like given the same weighting as like an amazing spy film. It's a linguist figures out how a language functions. And because in the, the, the whole idea of this language is that it changes the structure of your brain and you can see the past and the future at the same time simply by learning this language. So when I'm sort of approaching graphic scores, I'm thinking I want something, I want something where, you know, we we bring that same attention that we sort of think of it as something that has that potential, rather than something that we can just easily read. We we, we can sort of sight way our we can sight read our way through stuff. So that's where I'm coming from, and that often means that I make scores that I don't want people to perform, <laughs> or I'd rather that people just experience them as scores. And then it also means that I make scores which don't function like regular scores. So I'd like to just show you a few examples of what I'm talking about in my own work. So, oh, sorry, th there's a picture of Treatise by Cardew. Um, it's very difficult to give a talk when you can't see a preview of <laughs> the photographs down the bottom. So um, in the 2000s, I started making scores. I'm very interested in text scores. At the moment, I'm building an artificial intelligence, a neural network, which is trained on the entire corpus of um, text scores uh, from Fluxus onwards. There's some of your scores in there. <laughs> um, so uh, we're feeding it with loads and loads of scores, everything I could get my hands on uh, by many, many different composers. Um, but I started making text scores and I wanted them to be objects. So I created text scores which looked like this, which were, were my all my text scores in the beginning were in the framework of a sort of cooking system that was a product of the Milker Corporation. 
And so they were all objects. This was a recipe wheel that you turned around. Um, and they were they were presented as like collections of recipe cards in, in, in little sort of booklets that you got. And that was very important to me that the design of the score uh, was something which already began to draw you into the world of the score itself. Um, as things went on, um, and I developed a, a sort of a system of alter egos called Grupat that were all artists and sound artists uh, living in Dublin, all born in the 70s. That really gave me a space uh, to play with lots of different approaches to making scores in lots of different mediums. So, oops, what did I do? So, for example, um, and just be aware that all the names I'm going to use, they're all me, but I'm going to talk about them as if they're real people, because it's easier that way. So this is a score by Detlev Averens, who's an Estonian composer that lives in Ireland, and she's a systems analyst. And this is a score, this is one, uh, one folio from a sequence of 32 different folios, the same size. Um, and these are all drawings of microcurrents in the river Dodder. And so this, this, is, this is a score that she made. Um, this is another score by Detlev Averens. Um, the Marshallese Islanders, and this bit is really true, uh, the Marshallese Islanders in the South Pacific, they make what are called stick maps. And they're, they're literally maps made out of sticks. Um, and they show the ocean currents. So there's very little topographical features. because there's So you get a map that looks like this. And none of this is to do with land. It's just to do with energy flows uh, within the water. So that when they're canoeing, they know, OK, if I follow this current, I'm going to end up down here. And I thought this was probably the best analogy I've ever heard of for actual scores <laughs> in terms of like energy flows and things being pushed certain ways. Uh, that's how I think when I'm performing in, in terms of these sort of energy flows. So this is another score by Detleva. It's about uh, a meter and a half high and, and it sort of arranges these different sort of sounds that move nodes that move along energy flows. Um, also from Delava are some scores that are made out of tin, embossed tin, um, that are intended to also be read by blind people so that they're textured scores that you can run your fingers across. Um, the, this is a score by the Dowager Marchilove, who's a drag queen, um, who is a sort of a flaneur who walks around Ireland with a little um, three-legged Jack Russell terrier uh, to slow them down the same way that Salvador Dali had a tortoise. Um, and this is sort of walking these different paths around Ireland, uh, around Dublin in particular, looking for these different energetic flows, things like that. Um, this is a score by Turf Boone that was actually commissioned by the World Wildlife Foundation. So this is a score that's to do with the amount of fluoxetine, which is the active ingredient in Prozac. Um, and this is true. So many people in Manhattan take Prozac that they pee fluoxetine into the rivers. So the fish uh, all have fluoxetine in their systems. The fish around Manhattan all have antidepressants in their systems, which is terrifying. Um, so there's lots of symbols in here. It's difficult because we don't have the regular screen to see the detail. Um, other scores I made have elements which are mobile, so there's several layers to the score. Again, it's difficult because we don't have the screen. So there's different layers of paper and there's threads hanging down. One of the things I'm very interested in with... Um, oh, they're oh, very good, thank you. you can, so when people have performed the score, they often blow on it, so the threads get rearranged and then they, they use those as guidelines. Um, but one of the things I found myself particularly talking to my students about is the idea of depth in scores, because we tend to read scores as extremely flat surfaces. Um, there's a scene from my favorite Irish television program, Father Ted, which is a comedy about three priests. Um, and it's amazing. You can watch it on YouTube. Uh, but there's this scene where two of the priests are sitting. I've never felt more Irish than in this moment. Uh, two of the priests are sitting, and they have a window behind them, and there's cows outside. And then there's a little plastic cow, and one of the priests said, I've told you, this one is small. They're far away. Small, far away. And so often when I'm working with on graphic scores with my students, I say to them, but in December 1952, is that small or is it far away <laughs> in three-dimensional space? <laughs> to try and break out of this classic, we read from left to right, and it's a flat, it's a totally flat surface. So I'm sort of interested in scores that can get away from that. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> 
So again, scores that are made as objects, scores that have depth to them, that people can spend time with, open doors, poke around inside, that are three-dimensional scores, are important to me. But this brings me then to Ashtach, um, which is a project that I did that launched a couple of years ago, and that's an ongoing project. And to me, this is a huge score. And this is the sort of way that it's sort of, I, I think I can produce the results I'm sort of interested in producing. So Ashtach is an Irish word. It means sort of strange, queer, wondrous. So people will say, Istina Ashtach, eh? which means he's a funny old guy, um, but it's a nice compliment. It's a warm thing to say. So um, this project is sort of, uh, my, it's it, a lot of it is to do with my coming to terms with the fact that uh, we had a very, very strong avant-garde writing tradition in Ireland. We've got, you know, Beckett and Flann O'Brien and James Joyce and people like that. But we don't have historically a strong musical avant-garde. I like to hope that we did and it was dreamed in people's heads, but it did not make it into the history books. Um, there's no, in the Encyclopedia of Music in Ireland, there's no chapters on improvisation, for example. There's no evidence of data in Ireland or anything like that. So this sort of stems from me trying to find those roots. There are composers uh, like Ina Coyle who uh, sort of were active at the end of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century. A lot of them studied in, in London and they wrote music that at times was sort of very much um, in the sort of romantic orchestral tradition. They were often encouraged to write Irish art songs about living in Ireland because there was this sort of fashion amongst the Victorian English for nostalgic songs about living in Ireland, which is completely strange because they were colonizing Ireland and they liked to listen to songs about, you know, I dreamt of the farm back home and, and, and these sort of things. So if you were an Irish composer, you had a very confused sense of identity. You, you had in, in terms of what you were doing commercially, because people like Brian Boydell were producing these songs about being about sort of green tinted nostalgic glasses looking back at Ireland for London based audiences, Do you know, even though they'd lived out of Ireland for a while. So it's very, very complex and there's no clear path to the avant garde when you look at Irish music from this period. So. Um, when I started thinking about this project, I knew I wanted it to be a collaborative project. So there's a huge amount of people who have all contributed to this project. They're not all um, Irish, and that's very, very important, uh, because I wanted this to be something that was open. So there's quite a few American people and English people have contributed um, texts to the project. It still keeps going, and it still keeps being an open project, and we keep adding things to it. So the, the sort of the influence that we had was Ubu, because we thought Ubu.com is like an amazing resource, which I use constantly. And we thought we want to make the sort of the Irish Ubu. That's how it should feel when you go to it. So the graphic designer who did the design of the website tried to give it very much this sort of slightly sexy NGO vibe. D do you know what I mean? Like it's not slick enough to be a private um, pursuit, but but it clearly somebody put a little bit of thought. Th do you know what I mean? Into the logo and things like this. And when you go to this website, it presents that way. Um, there's uh, it's difficult for me to see. So along the top it says about Ash Talk, <laughs> online resources and contact us. So when you click on about Ash Talk. You go through to a site which describes it as an Irish avant-garde music archive, which begins in 1974. And then there's a disclaimer. And if you click on the disclaimer, it tells the truth. So quite often I get emails from people and, th and it I'll get an email from somebody at like 2.27 a.m. And it'll say, I love Ash Talk. Keep up the good work. Do you need any help with the data entry? Things like that. And then I get an email like at 4.31 a.m. that says, I just read the disclaimer. <laughs> Keep up the good work. <laughs> so uh, we're very happy that nobody has ever been annoyed so far. Uh, that that sort of because we we don't view it as a joke and we don't view it as a trick or trying to fool people. We view it as a sort of a parallel universe. <laughs> that that when we talk about Ash Talk, um, that parallel universe comes into contact with ours. It's also a pretty serious thought experiment. Because the reason that there isn't Irish um, avant-garde music, at least there isn't evidence of it, is because the historical period that we're dealing with was a time when Ireland was colonized. And when Ireland was extremely poor, 
Um, the slums in Dublin in the 20s were the worst. They were the worst slums in Europe. Um, they were fighting civil wars internally over Irish independence, as well as being involved to d in different degrees um, in the, the world wars that were going on. And there was a Catholic church that had a stranglehold over what was going on culturally, which meant that people like Oscar Wilde were fleeing and then getting sent to prison for being gay. So there's very clear reasons why this didn't happen. That also means that we can't just make stuff up. We can't pretend that there was a huge um, middle class that sustained a really crazy, wacky avant-garde because everybody had money to live on. We can't just invent that because it didn't exist. So we have to find weird places where we can sort of plant our little seeds like a crack in the pavement where you see a little tiny flower going and you think, okay, I'd found some earth there. So one of the, um, one of the things that we have to do, in fact, I let me... thought I had an image of this. So if you can see here, it says black magic fear in two border towns. And this is the cover of the Sunday world from 1974. Now people always think that we photoshopped this, but this is actually real. And it stems from a psychological ops campaign. And I'm not, I'm really telling the truth about this. A psychological um, ops campaign that the British army did in Northern Ireland, where they tried to link terrorism and black magic practice. So they tried to link being in the IRA with being a Satanist because they thought that this would deter young people from joining the IRA. And this happened in 1972 to 1974 when The Devil Rides Out and The Exorcist were in the cinemas. You know, because, the, you know, people were going to see The Exorcist and they were coming out scared shitless. And then somebody goes, you hear the IRA into the Satanism, you know, and they say, oh, I, I don't want to get involved in the IRA. I was going to do it, but I draw the line at the black magic stuff. Uh, so they planted, I think they planted like over 70 stories. There's a book about this um, by a sociologist called Black Magic, Fear and Bogeymen. Um, and oh, thanks David, I'm not thinking right. So this is a real story that was planted. Um, so they did things like they planted stories in the press. They also um, made fake black magic worship sites where they drew like magic circles, you know, on the ground and stuff like this. So when we read about this, we thought, this is so amazing. Like, there's no way you could make this up because it's just too crazy, but it actually happened. So that gave us the perfect frame for um, the, Malone, the, the Malone duo, uh, which we claim, the sort of Kilbride Malone duo, there we go, uh, which we claim were a duo of um, Karen Malone on saxophone and Stuart Kilbride on the uh, drums that invented noise music. And they were doing these crazy noise music improvisations and the British Army used to leave their recordings playing at these black magic sites because it sounded like people were possessed on the recordings and they had a really hard time of it and they moved to New York and lived in the East Village and predated John Zorn. So sort of this is what we would do is we would sort of try and find these little sites where we could plant that seed, where we could ostensibly, ostensibly make people believe that it happened. So um, there we go. So for example, um, we claim also um, within the context of, of Ashtok that drone music and therefore minimalism was invented in Ireland. And this came out of experiences I had. I lived in New York from 2006 to 2010 and I was very good friends with Tony Conrad. He was a really close collaborator of mine. And we had a lot of conversations about Lamont Young and the Theatre of Eternal Music and the Dream Syndicate and all the recordings that John Cale and Tony can't get their hands on. And and one day we were sort of joking, and I said, "What if it was all invented in Ireland?" <laughs> like it happened then, and he was like, "Go for it." So um, so I talked to a bunch of Irish etymologists, and and I said to them, "Like, what's the Irish word for drone?" And it turns out that there's lots of Irish words for drone. There's the drone of the bagpipes, the drone of the bees, all these different words. It's like Eskimos and snow. And um, the word I like the best was Durdon because it comes from the mythological figure of Deirdre. And when Deirdre was in her mother's womb, she screamed. So the idea of drone is linked to like screams coming out of like a, a woman's pregnant belly, which I think is, is really interesting. So um, in, in my sort of version of, of the evolution of drone music and minimalism, um, I place it on board a ship. These are actual um, immigration records from Ellis Island, which I photoshopped. 
So I invented this backstory of Porik McYallawirla. Um, he's a, an Irish, an, 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 an Irish kid that's born in the States. These are the Ellis Island immigration records of his parents. Uh, they end up moving back to Ireland and uh, because his father dies and Pori is very, very distressed because his father was teaching him the illan pipes, which is the Irish form of the bagpipes where you have a bag here. The Irish for your elbow is your illan. That's why they're called the illan pipes. And so he started playing these really, really long drone performances where he would just play the drones and not actually play any of the melodies on the on the illan pipes. And the backstory, of course, goes that these recordings were made by the Irish Folklore Commission, which are an amazing, amazing organization that went around the country in the 20s that had people like Alan Lomax over helping collect folk songs. When John Cage was in Ireland interested in writing Roratorio, this w these were people he was in contact with. Um, so the story goes that these recordings were found languishing in the archives. They were just too weird to ever be presented to the public. And an intrepid musicologist dug them out, cleaned them up and released them to the public. So Dirt On, the album, is always presented as an album that's just about to be released. Um, it's always presented as like a printer's proofs for the album cover and it's just about to come out um, after it's been exhibited and has a fake barcode and it has RTE, which is the Irish broadcasters. Sorry, I'll do what David did. It has the logos of used legally of different organizations like the Irish Folklore Commission and RTE. And I've had the experience quite a few times that um, probably the, the best form of it was the BBC contacted me and they said, we're trying to get in contact with the person at RTE that we need to speak to to get permission. And I was like, put the phone down, please. Um, <laughs> you, you can just use it, it's fine. Um, so, so sort of, it's a, it's a listening post that people go to and they listen to these recordings and they sort of imagine what Irish drone music felt like and uh, sort of this idea of, of sort of what it was that there could have been drone music back in the 20s in Ireland. Um, other figures from um, the Ashtok project include the Guinness Dadaists. So Guin uh, Dadaism in Ireland happened a little bit later uh, because during sort of like 1913, we had the Dublin lockouts and the Dublin strikes. There was a lot of other stuff going on. So it took a little bit longer to happen. And Dadaism in Ireland is rooted in the Irish language. So there was also sort of a political aspect to that because the Irish language and what's called the Unseal alphabet, which, is, uh, which was historically used to write texts in Irish is phenomenally difficult for um, non-speakers to pronounce. So sort of the Irish dataists, all who worked at the Guinness Brewery, so they're called the Guinness dataists, um, they, they sort of wanted to use Irish language pronunciation rules in sound poetry because then if you were from England you couldn't pronounce it, you couldn't read it. Um, so it's this is a, uh, this was a project that was premiered um, alongside a presentation by the Japanese sound artist Tomomi Adachi, who's a close collaborator of mine, where he was talking about Mavo, the Irish, uh, sorry, the Japanese um, sort of quasi data movement, and I was talking about the Guinness data, the Guinness dataists, and we were performing both uh, pieces by both, and Mavo are real, and at the end of the performance, everybody thought that he'd made everything up and that everything I had said was true, which was completely bizarre. Um, so when I make these projects, um, there's a lot of different collaborators, there's a lot of different people. Um, we try to sort of make it as rich as possible. Um, the character of Roisin Madigan O'Reilly, who's the intrepid Irish uh, ham radio enthusiast, um, who did a lot of performances, uh, created by uh, Felix Ford, Felicity Ford, a, a British sound artist. Uh, she collected like a whole appendix of all these different images from historical Irish uh, sites that she associates with Roisin Madigan O'Reilly. We also have Cuivine Branagh, who's an Irish outsider artist who used to uh, record sounds on tapes. He's sort of like a tape artist. So there's a lot of different people included in this. And when we present Ash Talk, there's the website and there's a book that you can print from Lulu. I believe it's actually for sale out there, but you can also just order it from Lulu and you just pay to have it printed. We don't make any money um, off that. Um, 
but there's a lot of work that's been added to it. So we keep having new artifacts, we keep having new personae that are added to it. Um, and we have, hu we have like last year, we had a big exhibition in Ireland where we had a performative installation that was sort of this occultist, occultist ritual uh, drawn from the workings of Cuivin Branagh and other people within it. And, um, and that was done in collaboration with um, a gallery called The Model uh, in Ireland that have a huge collection of Irish painting. And we were allowed to take it and make up completely new ideas of provenance for these famous Irish paintings. So taking like key Irish modernist there were actually cubists in Ireland and they were mostly women, which is really interesting. So we were able to take original Maine Gellet paintings and like contextualize them within the Ashtok archive and create links and things like that. So it tends to be a project that institutions will allow us to lie completely about everything because they enjoy this sort of identity play. So um, the reason I show that is because for me that is, I, s I see the website and the texts around it all as a score. <laughs> It's like a world building exercise because when we made the music, because there's hours of recordings on the website, when we made the music for all of these recordings, oftentimes people were just emailing us and saying, you know, I finished the text <laughs> on Alexander T. Black, Sligo's secret outsider and the recordings he made in the ice house with this woman that never loved him and was sent to Berlin to get her away from him because he was such a weirdo. And we would have to read all of these texts, look at the pictures, and then try and reverse engineer what we thought the music sounded like from this world. So that's maybe closest to my dream of what the notation can look like. Um, it a lot of people working together collaboratively, a huge amount of work and thought into sort of reverse engineering pieces that didn't exist from artifacts that people present in the, in the sort of here and now. Um, I was going to play a couple of minutes from a film, but it doesn't make sense because it's just too tiny and we don't have sound <laughs> on this laptop. Um, so I think I'll just finish it there. I think I've gone perfectly in terms of the time. Thanks very much. <laughs> We have a couple of minutes for questions before Jennifer has to run off. Is there, are there questions? You have to think quickly now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For the recording, but I think this is an important one, okay? All right, uh, maybe if I share. Just a quick question, really, um, about the, um, this project that you mentioned, the neural network thing mm -hmm. with the corpus of verbal scores. Could you say maybe a bit more about that, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want? Um, I, I'm very interested in tech scores. I think they're one of the most powerful mediums. They're very democratic, and that's what I like about them. Anybody can participate in, in um, making music with tech scores. Um, at the moment, I teach at the University of the Arts in Stuttgart, so I'm teaching in a conservatoire, but I also teach a lot of art students from the visual arts school there, and they love text scores because a lot of them have no musical training, and it means they can get involved. And I think that the text score, it's almost like the fairy tale that was told to anybody who's interested in experimental sound at the moment. Like Flux's text scores are like our childhood bedtime stories or something like that. So it's very, very deep in our consciousness. It's a really important part of experimental music. But the thing that drives me that I find difficult is that the syntax has remained almost exactly the same. The grammar has remained almost exactly the same. So if you look at a word event by James Saunders and John Lely, there's a whole chapter about the grammar in, in the scores. So when people create them now, I often cannot tell just from the score, whether it was created 30 years or 40 years ago or today. And you have like a 23 year old kid who's really excited about tech scores writing as if it's still 1970 or something like that. So I started doing a lot of experiments with tech scores, starting with those recipe, <laughs> recipe things. Um, and then, you know, with the advent of sort of access to technology, I started doing a lot of projects. I did tech score projects on Snapchat. Um, and then I started taking, using Markov chain scripts where I could put checks, text scores into the Markov script and then get results out and then crossbreed them with things and then crossbreeding tweets and, and things like that. Um, but in the last couple of years, I'm interested in, I'm very interested in AI. So um, what I've been doing is, is taking huge archives. James Saunders gave me his whole archive for word event. There's my archives. There's lots and lots of other scores that people gave me. And 
they're all at the moment it's a real pain and it takes a lot of time because they all have to be converted into Unicode. They all have to be in a very specific format. We have insanely long discussions about what does the title mean? What does it mean when it's a dedication? Where should this go? What about punctuation? What about the layout? What about the font? So just to clean up the data to get it into the condition that it can go into the network is hugely problematic. But one of the things we found very, very interesting from one of the coders is that um, the text scores, one of the things that's good to train the neural network on is text where you have sentences that begin with a verb. That seems to be the absolute, you know, make a tone, <laughs> play a long sound, <laughs> wait for a while. Like that seems to be a really important textual marker of text scores that the, the neural network needs. So we have to train at times the neural network on loads and loads of pre-existing text that isn't text scores and it's so it, it sort of takes, extracts from that corpus everything that begins with a verb. <laughs> and you might only have 10 sentences in a novel that begin with a verb, but in one text score, <laughs> you know, nearly every sentence will begin with a verb um, and it'll be in the passive voice and things like that. So what I want to do is to be able to take text scores and then crossbreed them with things, crossbreed them with the Merriam-Webster words that have been most recently introduced to the English language and sort of see what happens when we sort of wrench them together and bring them bring them up to date with what's happening. Um, so that's sort of where my interest lies. I, you know, a lot of people will always write text scores in this, in, you know, using that same syntax and I, that's totally fine, that's their thing, but I sort of think a lot of really interesting things have happened to language and it's a shame that text scores would lag behind all of those things. One uh, question about the near future, because you're playing tonight. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask you if you could talk a bit about the piece that you're okay. presenting. <laughs> um, the piece I'll do tonight, um, the different movements on it are, have they were all taken, they were all trained using different neural networks. So, for example, one of the neural networks was trained on the Goop newsletters from Gwyneth Paltrow and her Goop website. Um, and things like that. Some of them were trained on all of the Eric Satie performance indications that you get, which I have to say in terms of text scores, like those blew my mind when I was a kid and I, l I love Satie and I learned his piano music and he'd, you know, there'd be performance directions like, like out of your head in a rainbow. And I was like, this is the best thing ever and, and stuff. So I used different neural networks to train on different corpuses. Um, also doing things like trying to get neural networks to write Gregorian chant and um, there's a metaphor that machine learning people use, which is too vanilla and too spicy. <laughs> so you sort of have to tune the network because if it's too vanilla, it'll produce something that's really boring. And if it's too spicy, it looks like Brian Fernyhoe. <laughs> and, you know, and they're trying to find this sweet spot where it actually functions somewhere in, in the middle. Um, my interest in AI is not that we're writing stable AI that can copy art that already exists. There's a huge amount of projects out there like Deep Bach that they've trained to write chorales by Bach, but I'm much more interested in the spicy, weird stuff <laughs> um, because um, I genuinely do feel that in the next sort of 20 to 40 years, AI is going to increase to such, uh, the, the sort of the, the strength of AI, it's not gonna replace everybody and it's not gonna be intelligent enough to replace all of us, but within a huge amount of the genres of music that currently exist, AI will be strong enough to create music within those genres that will be indistinguishable. So having seen the research and having seen what people are already doing, um, I have no doubt that f 20 to 40 years from now, if you're a film, mu com film music composer, you'll do it in collaboration with AI, which creates libraries of material, and then you just go in there. In the same way that Hans, Hans Zimmer has like a load of assistants that make, you know, emotional theme number 37 for him and then he just goes through and then, you know, decides how to, how to orchestrate it or whatever. So um, I think things are going to really change and I feel that sort of this is a time where we can still play, <laughs> where, where there's still a chance to really mess around and try and think of what, what are these changes going to mean for us, <laughs> what, what are these changes going to mean for music, for art. Um, everybody in this room probably has a phone is that right? Does everybody in this room have a phone? 
that means that you're all participating in AI right now because there's a neural chip in your phone um, that is your phone is training for Google or Apple or whoever constantly. So, so everybody's participating in AI all the time, whether or not we ever write a piece of music using code. Every single time you take a picture on your phone, the neural chip is going crazy doing like high dynamic range photographs and p compositing them and figuring out where your face is before you take the photograph. So it's here. <laughs> so I'm just trying to pay attention to it through the pieces that I write. Thanks for that. One last question. Maybe for me then. Um, what you're, you, you were saying you, were wa you want to get people in involved, engaged with the scores, that's your, rather mm -hmm. than execute or perform it. And then I'm wondering how, um, a work like the Ashtag body of, of work and scores and all that they are, what the role of people uh, then, I you're not, you're very inexplicit indeed with, with what people's engagement can be. Mm -hmm. um, how does that play out? Is there, I you don't want to give them a role? Do then people actually come up and just assume roles, ways of engaging with the scores? And mm -hmm. does that, even if you don't foresee it, does it play a part for you in how the score is realized, actualized? Is, is is there still room for people to also act on the work in some way? Or is the work s oh somewhat no, closed Oh, no, definitely. Then? It's very open. So, for example, Roisin Madigan O'Reilly, the, the um, radio enthusiast, um, I got an email from uh, a, a feminist sound art collective in Australia, and they said, we're doing a performance of Roisin Madigan O'Reilly on the beach. <laughs> And they sent me these photographs and I was just really happy because they'd taken it and they'd interpreted it in their own way and made it their own and done something that I couldn't have predicted. So I'm very happy for people to come and, and participate with the project and do things. Um, the other thing too I should say is that like it allows me to bring people into my work that wouldn't normally fit. So for example, um, I have a house in Ireland in, in Knock Vicar, and, and that's where I claim some of the Ashtag people li lived <laughs> and things like that. And up the road is this town of Sligo, and we did a huge exhibition in Sligo. And there's a guy there, he's in his 80s now, his name's Michael Quirk, and he's basically sort of like a folk artist. He does wood carvings. His father was a butcher, and he stopped being a butcher because he thought that was boring, and he started doing wood carving in the butcher's shop. So when you go into the butcher's shop, there's this old man, and he's carving these like wolves and cats and things out of wood. And I just said to Michael Quirk one day, I'm doing this exhibition and they're all totally fake and can we put some of your work in it? <laughs> you know, and, and he's like, yeah, sure, great, yeah, yeah, go on, I'll take it now, yeah, yeah. And, and sort of, so we were really happy because, you know, this is like a folk artist that doesn't normally, that doesn't normally get his work exhibited and it made perfect sense to put his work in, you know, and he wrote this text for us about his work and how the mythology is mixed with poetry and things like that inside it. So it's not just that other, that artists can come <laughs> and sort of step into it. Um, and there's certainly, I mean, there's been kids who've come to performances and drawn pictures of, you know, what they think some of the alter egos look like and stuff like that. But also it allows us to open up to what would not be considered a standard, you know what I mean, professional artists and sort of, uh, and, and involve people within it. It's basically a, a, a play, it's like a character universe to play in. So, you know, if any of you want to be involved, just send me an email. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks very Jennifer. much.